Hey people. So if I have never invited you to be a part of Praying Pastor M, let me apologize officially. And let me take this opportunity to invite you to be a part of a very growing family on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, please follow me at Pastor Mildred and join me 3 p.m. every day, West African time, to be a part of what we do. Um, it's just a time where we get to learn about the Word of God, have fun, talk about real life issues, and just connect with each other. So please be a part of it every day of the week, Monday to Saturday, 3 p.m. with p.m. Praying with Pastor M. God bless you. I don't have so much time, so I'm going to get right into it. We're still on at all cost. Um, and today we're going to be talking about evangelizing your children. Um, let's start from Romans 12. I read verse 1, message translation. It says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you. It says, take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and walking around life and place it before God as an offering. Now that's what God expects of us as Christians. If you're a child of God, he expects that you will, everything that you do will be worship. So you're eating, for instance, what you put in your body because your body is the temple of Holy Spirit. So junk should not be put into your body. That's worship. If you give up soda, fizzy drinks, that's worship. It's not until you come here and sing, because not all of us will be graced with voices like voices that are in TRI. But you're going to work and being excellent at your job. That's your worship. And that's what we established last week. Okay? We established that your lifestyle evangelism is even louder than the words that you speak. So it's important that you remember that. So what does that mean? That means that your parenting is also worship to God. God expects that you will parent with the consciousness that it is service to him. Whether you like it or not, the children that you bring into this world, they're not yours. They are God's own. You are just simply God's nannies. You're just God's stewards. So if God has put those children into your hands, there's a reason why God wants them. Um, Malachi 2.14. Okay. So they were crying about their prayers not being answered. And then God said, do you know why? So basically, he was talking about why their prayers were not being answered and their offerings were not being received. He says, simple. Because God was there as a witness when you spoke your marriage vows to your young bride. And now you've broken those vows, broken the faith bond with your vowed companion, your covenant wife. Give me verse 15. He says, God, not you, made marriage. So contrary to what you believe that, oh, we just fell in love. Or you finish from primary school, you go to secondary school, you go to university, you serve, get a job, then you marry. Or in some people's case, marry and don't get a job. He says, God, not you made marriage. Why? His spirit inhabits even the smallest details of marriage. And he says, and what does he want from marriage? Children of God, that's what. That's what he wants. You are the one that wants companionship. You are the one that wants synergy. You are the one. What does God want? God wants godly seed. Godly seed, that's what King James calls it. But he says he wants children of God. So how will God have children of God if we don't, give, we don't raise them for him? God's not going to come from heaven and do that work. So when he gives you a child, he's expecting that you turn that child into a godly seed. The emphasis here is godly, okay? Godly, not moral. Not well-behaved, not polite, godly. The only way for something to be godly is if it is born of God. Do you understand that? So if your child is not born of God, he may be well-behaved, he may not drink, he may not smoke, but he's not godly seed. And that is where I need to draw the line this morning for a lot of us as parents. A lot of us believe that if we can just raise them to say, please, thank you, excuse me, raise them not to drink, not to smoke, but they are not born again, their nature is not transformed. Because being born again is not a change of behavior, it's a change of nature. It is God replacing that heart of flesh, that stony heart, with a heart that can receive his spirit. It is you becoming like God. That's why when Nicodemus went to Jesus and said, how can you be doing these great things? It means God is with you. He said, no, that's not just... It's not about doing. It's about being. You must first be born again so your eyes can be open to see the possibilities that are available to you. 
So if your children are not transformed in their nature, they cannot do, they cannot behave well. And ultimately, even if they live on earth and they do all the right things, if your children are not born again, they will not go to heaven. I know they are cute. I know they are pretty. I know that, oh, my baby is such a, oh, my baby, how much? Hell. It will be a cute baby in hell. A cute son in hell. Oh, my son is very charming. In hell. So as much as we are focusing on getting them to be polite, to, to be exposed, to speak good English, to go to the best schools, if your children are not born again, they will end up in hellfire. And this is not a threat you should go and give them. The threat is for you. But I need you to understand this, and we need to establish that. All the investments you are making in schools, also make it in training your children in the knowledge of God. Amen? Are you already angry? You've not even started. I also need to say this so that I don't put you under pressure. You may never be the one to personally lead your children to Christ. However, you have a responsibility to pray for them, to pray that the Lord sends laborers along their path so that they will encounter him. It's also your responsibility to pray that their spirits will be receptive to God's word, that their hearts will be sensitive to the word of God, and to create opportunities where they are already exposed to the things of God. So that's your job. You may never, some, some people will have the privilege, and I pray that we all do, but if we don't, the important thing is not who leads them to Christ. It's the fact that they are now born again, filled with the Spirit of God, and that they make it to heaven. So don't be under pressure to go home now and say, have you given your life to Christ? Say after me, Lord Jesus. They may say it, but they may not mean it. And the Bible says that you must believe in your heart, then say. So it's not just about saying, you must believe in your heart. So there must be a believing before there's a saying. Okay? So our job is to put things in place to make it easier for them to receive. So what are the things you must put in place? Number one, choose who you marry carefully. That's the first way to evangelize your child. The first step to getting your children, giving them a chance to be born again, is to choose who you marry wisely. I can give you a million and one scriptures. A million and one scriptures. Okay, let's start from Genesis 24, from verse 1. And I want you to see how important it is. You know, it was so important that Abraham made his servant swear. He didn't just say, oh, take my... He he told him to swear and oh, see. It says, now Abraham was old and well advanced in age, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. So Abraham was prosperous, which also meant that Isaac was enjoying the benefits of that prosperity. And that is where most of us are. The Lord has blessed us. So our children are in the best schools. They're in the best. They're doing the, everything. They're enjoying life. Some of the privileges we didn't even have, they have today. But see what he said, verse 2. He says, so Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had. He said, please put your hand under my thigh. And I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among who I dwell. Verse 4. But you shall go to my country and to my family and take a wife for my son Isaac. And the servant said to him, perhaps the woman will not be willing to follow me to this land. Must I take your son back to the land from which he came? He said, but Abraham said to him, beware that you do not take my son back there. Seven. The Lord God of heaven who took me from my father's house and from the land of my family and who spoke to me and swore to me saying to your descendants, I will give this land. He said, he will send his angel before you and you shall take a wife for my son from there. Verse eight. And says, and if the woman is not willing to follow you, then you will be released from this oath. That's how serious it was that he says, swear. I'm not even going to leave it to chance that you just obey me. He says, swear that you will not. If it was not such an important thing, who Isaac should marry. Remember, Isaac was the child of promise. So it was important that whoever he joined himself with also was a part of the covenant. So you go and carry an unbeliever and join your body. You have already caught the chance of your children ever encountering Christ by 50%. Because you want to serve God. Daddy does not want to serve God. You want to serve God. Mommy is not interested. And the funny thing about children is that they learn more from what they see than what they hear. 
So they are watching you more than they are listening to you. In fact, if you have really young children, sometimes you wonder if they hear. Because you'll be calling them, they'll be looking at you like this. And they will just log out as if you don't exist. But everything you do, they will come to children's church and say it. And you'll be wondering, ah, I didn't know. I used to be in children's church, so I know. The children I used to teach were between the ages of three to five. Every Sunday was gist. That's how my daddy not carry my mommy, not give my mommy power. Don't do my mommy like this, bah. My mommy not give my daddy, bah. We now call the parents. Ah, ah. Your children say you are fighting at home. No, don't mind them. We're just praying in tongues. I say, how do you bah and bah in tongues? So whether you like it or not, your children are watching. So it's not really what you are saying. You say pray, but you are not praying. They are watching you. You say go to church. You are not going to church. They are watching you. Hmm. So the choices that you make affect your children. If you marry somebody who does not believe in God, your children will likely. When you want to get married, I think one of the questions you should ask yourself is do I want to, I, do I want to reproduce after this kind? That's what you need to ask yourself. It will give you clarity. Because if you plant mango tree, mango tree will bring out mango fruit. If you plant banana, it will bring out banana. It's only human beings that want to plant unbeliever and bring out believer. Only human beings. Because we are magicians. There's a natural order of things. Except God divinely helps you. Somebody is praying and invites God into the situation. But if not, if you marry a drunkard, you have a 90% chance of producing a drunkard. If you marry a woman nicer, that's why I tell men, you don't understand what you are doing. You are sowing seeds. Adultery is a spirit that does not leave families old. So you are giving your son, if you don't win that battle, your son is most likely going to fight that battle again. Read the Bible now. David was not the only one that fought giants. David's descendants fought giants as well. But because David won, they won too. So you're already creating problems for your children if you marry the wrong person. He doesn't believe in the things of God. He doesn't believe in church. Church is in the heart. This is your heart way wicked like this. The church way they inside high won't be. <laughs> so it starts from there. The Bible says do not be unequally yoked. Do not be unequally yoked. Don't think about it. Don't calculate it. Don't say, maybe I can somehow, perhaps, if I try. You can't change anybody. You that you have known yourself since they gave birth to you. You have some bad habits you have been trying to stop. You have not stopped. So why do you think that you can change someone? Women are the most guilty of this. If I marry him, I can pray. I believe I'm sent to him. Two months into the marriage, you are done. You are sent to him. Only to him. Meanwhile, unbelievers are everywhere. You are not sent to them. Why do you want to make your life hard? Why do you want to suffer for nothing? Marry wisely. Must you be using prayer to change man? Why can't you use prayer to pray that you will be blessed? That there will be money? That things will be happening? Promotion? Every day your mates are praying for promotion. You at home. God, this man, this man, this man, this man. High blood pressure for nothing. Meanwhile, you had a chance. Single girls, draw your ear this morning. If you are single, draw your ear. Let me see your hand in your ear. Draw the two. Because let me tell you, I'm counseling you now. If I hear that you marry rubbish, I will cancel you. <laughs> By who you marry, you've already given your children a chance. When your children see mommy and daddy praying together, when they see them going for evangelism, do you think they'll be telling them, they'll just know that this is how we behave in this family. It's our culture. When we have a problem, we pray. When we have a, when we, I mean, we are, we are lovers in this family. We are kind, we are patient with each other. And then you have framed what marriage should be for them. So they will continue it. Not every day, my daddy come and give my mommy power driver. My mommy come and somersault my daddy. What is all that? And then we're undoing half the problems. What am I saying? 99% of the problems we're dealing with in church is from families. When you bring anybody into... Pastor Judy, I can't now. When you put two people down and they say... When you just ask, what was your parents' marriage like? What do you hear? Problem. 
So they've already given them problem before they've even started the marriage. So you are starting from reverse. Your children have a chance when you marry a godly woman or a godly man. Your children understand godly principles when they see it. Not just when they hear it. I can shout here for 20 minutes, but if, if you go home, I say love one another, honor, respect. And you get home and you see your mother slapping your father. What will be formed in your mind is the pictures, not what I'm saying. Because we hear in pictures. So it's easy for you to just see something. So if you've, if you've seen your mom act like you don't need a man, you two, you will marry with that. It will be somewhere at the back of your mind. So when you enter the marriage and the man starts misbehaving, the first thing you tell yourself is, I don't need this. I don't, I definitely don't need this amount. I'm done. If you see your father beating your mother, if the wife just talk pain, she be beat. It's not you, you carry now. Because greater works shall you do. So that's the first thing, marry right. Marry right, choose right. Evangelism is not, uh, my child, Jesus is the only way. Jesus is which only way? Meanwhile, daddy, daddy get another way. Second thing, if you want to evangelize your children, is you must parent as a team. And I need to speak to the men here. Parenting is not a woman's job. Do we have men in the house? Do we have men in the house? Men, I need you to say this after me. Say, parenting is not a woman's job. Parenting is not a woman's job. In fact, if you look all over the Bible, you will see where God was talking to the men most times. It is fathers he will call. He kept calling fathers. Um, let's read Genesis eighteen nineteen, And I'm using Abraham because he was the, I mean, he was the one God started the covenant with. He says, yes, I have settled on him as the one to train his children and future family to observe God's way of life, to live kindly and generously and fairly so that God can complete in Abraham what he promised him. This is God talking about Abraham. He didn't say I've settled on her. If he had said I've settled on her, that means he was talking about Sarah. He said I've settled on him as the one to train his children. Fathers, train your children. Hey, I can't say this enough. Women, you will not support me now. You will not come and be sending me DM that I will not read. Train your children. It's your responsibility as fathers to train your children. I want to, there's one other scripture that I want to read to you. And I think it's important. Ephesians 6 verse 4. If you can give me the Amplified Classic. If not, let me just read it. It says, fathers... Look at that scripture. He didn't say parents, so. What did he say? Fathers. What did he say? Fathers. He said, fathers, do not irritate and provoke your children to anger. Do not exasperate them to resentment, but rear them tenderly in the training and discipline and counsel and admission of the Lord. You say you don't know what parenting is. They've broken it down for you. Train your children. Discipline them. Counsel them. Admonish them. Fathers, not go and meet your mommy. Mm. they will come from school so we need to I'm very busy I'm very busy the, mo the mother will come the mother like say no be two of us dwarf. because at what point are you now going to be involved only sex now me carry the bikini now me push up now me carry and go school PTF now me hospital now me immunization now me at what point daddy Don't worry, now, when, she, when they want to marry, it's the man they will call. They don't used to call women in these things. Fathers, train your children. You must parent as a team. If you want your children to be evangelized, your wife cannot be going to church, and you will drop them and turn around and go home. Fathers! Children get the identity from their fathers. They get nurture from their mothers, but they get identity. Especially boys. That's why we have a lot of boys misbehaving in church. Because mommy is in church praying. Prayer is a woman's thing. And before you go with your mother, just let me go downstairs. 
tell Yasikira to give you two bottles of beer and bring it for me. Then follow your mother, follow your mother. It's okay. What? You must parent as a team. They must see both mother and father make investment into spiritual things. If your child sees you bow to God, he will know there's someone greater than daddy. So when it's time to worship, don't do like this. Lift your hands. If tears are coming down, don't hold it back. Cry. Let your children see that there's somebody greater than you. That when there's a problem, you run to somebody. Then they will know that that God is real. They will not consider him to be a mommy's God. You need to parent as a team. You must do it together. One person can't be doing the work and another person is spoiling. How does Pastor K say that? One is a pillar, the other is a caterpillar. We need to do this together. Which takes me to my next point. Be intentional. You need to be intentional about raising your children together. So sometimes, daddy, lead prayer, sir. See, I'm telling you, your children watch more than they hear you. All this you're shouting is not working. I'm shouting, I'm shouting. People want to kill me. No, they don't want to kill you. They just want to see you do what you said they should do. If you're not too hard, mommy, do them. You tell them to go and fast. Then you are making food for daddy. How? Praise God. We need to be intentional about these things. Because if your children end up in hell, they will swear for you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And unfortunately, um, salvation is not hereditary. I'll be honest. Yes. Every man will stand for himself. You won't say, ah, and, and I was serving God though. God, remember, that's my son, Obosa. Stories that touch. Obosa has to stand for himself and say, I believe that the Lord Jesus died for me and paid my price. That's why I think I have a right to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And he should say with confidence because the accuser will come there. So be intentional about it. You must do it together. Together. Pray with your children. Let them be used to seeing spiritual things in the house. Mommy, my head is paining me. Eh, check down my wardrobe. Two panadol, they dear. How about you put your hands on their head and pray for them? And let them understand that this is how we deal with our problems. God first. That child will learn it. That will be their, their default mode when there's anything going on. Not, we try everything else. If we no work, then maybe we try God. Because that's what we're teaching our children. The child comes to you with a problem. You can't solve it. You say, oh, we have a family pastor. Let us call the pastor to pray for us. Daddy, you are the head of this home. You are the priest of your home. How about you hold your child's hand and pray? That's why we have so many people going from place to place looking for who to pray for them. Because these things are not established in the home. Be intentional about it. Pray with your children. Break bread at home. Do communion. Let them be used to the, the things they hear in church. Let it not be, that's church. This is home. Let there not be division in the life. The life must be one. What we do in church on Sunday is what we do throughout the week. Pray with your children. Fast. Take them on evangelism. Teach them. Teach them the word. Watch what they watch. Watch what they watch. Don't let phones train your children. Listen, I know it's convenient and we all do it. Every single one of us. They disturb you too much. Take, 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 take. Mommy's busy. They don't touch that this phone, no. But mommy, you give them your own. But you, the problem is you're not watching what they're watching. They go on YouTube. And you think YouTube is your partner in parenting? YouTube has their own agenda. Your child is watching something, then shaky bum, 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 shaky bum, bum, will just come up suggested view and the child will just press it Otom. then you'll be wondering where are these children learning bad things from your phone man it's your phone be intentional even the things you think are safe some of these cartoons are not safe 
I remember when, when Dr. was very young. And I didn't, because she's not girly like that. So she's more of a tomboy. So I didn't want to try to change her personality per se. So I knew that that time, she is cartoon, they used to train children. You just put cartoon for her. But I couldn't find any Disney princess that, when she was younger. Then they started Sophia the first. So I felt, oh, finally a princess who is not about, oh, a prince is coming to save me and marry me. Because even me, that seems to annoy me. Because that's the problem. That's the problem. Why are you the way you are? It's what you watched. You watched Cinderella. You watched Sleeping Beauty. So you want to sleep. You don't want to do any work. One man should not come and kiss you. And your life should be okay. You want to be Rapunzel. You just buy bone straight. One prince will now see the bone straight. That's what is changing. That's what's, that's what's affecting you. It's what's affecting you. So we need to be careful what we are indoctrinating our children with. Unfortunately, it's so sad that there are very, very few Christian um, cartoons that can stand side by side. Pata Pata, uh, story, what's that book? Books? Super story, if I say not super, super book. Now one could buy mutual super story. Very few. So I now said, ah, okay, Sophia the first. She's not really interested in clothes or anything. She was about character, being nice, being helpful, being all those things, and being a regular person, even though she was a princess. So I said, oh, this is nice. This will be something to raise that sound. So I started buying bag, t shirt dress. I will put it for her. One day, I heard my daughter singing, I'm going to be a good little witch, something, something. I say, witch. Ah, I'm a pastor. I said, you want to be a what? She said, mommy, don't you know this song? I'm going to... I said, don't say grab it. What, what are you... Don't, what? She now said, is Sophia the first? I said, it's not possible. That's how I sat down with my daughter to watch Sophia the first. Day. She had one little friend who the mother was a bad witch, but wanted to be a good witch. So she was trying to be a good witch, but her mother was spoiled. If, she does, if her mother does bad things, she will come and use her power and change it. I say, you say, wait. <laughs> From that day, Sophia the first, oh, Sophia the last, oh, I don't want to know. Imagine not watching it. Imagine thinking it was okay. Some of these cartoons today, they are pushing the agenda of homosexuality. Why can't I have two daddies like there's one person, odd couple or something that has two daddies? I say, which two daddies? The one daddy you have, have you finished using him? My friend, stand well. Some of those things, you need to be vocal about it. Our children need to understand. Vida has asked me before, because Vida is the one that asked all the question in this world. She has asked me before, why can't a woman marry a woman? I say, because God said man and woman. Look, man. But you see, I have to go back and think that if they are thinking like this, we need to be thinking like that so we can answer their questions. You know, when we were younger, it is because I said so. Because I said so does not mean anything again. Because I said so, the next question you hear is, why did you say so? So be intentional. Ask questions they will ask in your mind and find the answers. One day I was doing uh, money, di- no, devo- I always do devotion with them at night. I don't know how many of them in the evening. And then we're reading about Gen- the Genesis story, the creation story, and how Adam sinned, and then Adam and Eve sinned, and then Satan came and born. And then Vida just asked me, that what if God, what if Satan is the real God, and God is Satan, and they're just, they just lying to us? Eh? <laughs> I say, God, which guy picking me this for my belly? What is, what is? Why can't you just, why can't you be normal? Why will you ask all those questions? David has started answering, oh no, because see, because God is more powerful. Because if Satan was God, then God would not have been able to deal with Satan. God pun- I say, pastor, thank you. You are the ones that will answer your generation. So the, they will, you need to just raise them. They will do the work. So be intentional, be very intentional. Be very intentional. If you don't know what to do, I've broken it down to you for Ephesians 6.4. Train them, discipline them, counsel them. And, and this, let's not flog our children. There's a new agenda now. You don't tell children no. You haven't heard that one? Oh, don't tell children no because um, you, it, it affect, negativity affects their, their self-esteem. 
And so they will not be able to make decisions in future because they feel... Just because of that, I just wake up in the morning and just be telling them no. Just no down. No, 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 no. Don't be throwing it around. Let me tell you, anything the world says, it will be contrary to the word. So you must be resolute as a child of God to say it is, this is our manual for life and for raising our children. If the Bible says I, will, I should beat you, foolishness abounds in the heart of a child. First of all, who created the heart? Who created the child? Who is telling you there's foolishness in what he created? And who is telling you how to remedy it? And you are still arguing. You are still arguing. Let them bring the human being they've created. Let them bring the heart. Not be borrowed from Paul to, uh, Peter to pay Paul. I borrow from Neka, give Amaka hearts. That's what they are doing. It's not heart transplant. Make them bring from scratch. Make we see. God is telling you, train your children. Spare the rod and spoil the child. You say, For a, a, a child should never associate your hands with pain. It's, it's, there. it's all over social media now. Why are you doing as if you are not seeing it? I will beat you and I will argue. Yes, Nothing do you. They beat me and they hugged me and I'm okay. That's balance. If I pet you, pet you, pet you, you tilt to one side. Sometimes I would just, my even, see, let me tell you, sometimes parenting is not only you. Parenting is their siblings as well. My elder sister used to just beat us for nothing. She just say, come. I know say you go so offend me, so come and slap you. And we adjusted. Uh, those days when Pastor Pascal has disturbed me many times now. He's the last born of five boys. He said those days when he was small, they want to go and fetch water because they didn't have a borehole in their house. They want to go and fetch water. They will not say, oh, leave him nice, the small boy. He said, oh, no, there's small buckets. <laughs> Move! We must be intentional about discipline. And when you're disciplining your children, you must explain to them why. I'm not just beating you because I want to be wicked. I'm beating you because this thing, if I, if I beat you and you associate it with pain, you won't do it again. Mommy, I won't do it again. Exactly. If you don't misbehave too, I will never beat you again. Do you see we're okay? You won't do it again. I won't beat you again. This is, the, this is, the, this is what we used to mark the covenant. I beat you. You remember it. Anytime you want to do it, you remember it. God has solution. You can't be smarter than God. The next thing, start early. Oh, start early. The Bible says train up a child, not an adult. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he grows, if you're an adult, you're not growing anywhere again. So it's a child you train. And then when the person is an adult, you trust that the training you gave them will work. If you did not train your child in the things of God, they will not have anything to go back to when they grow up. So prayer, they are not too young to pray. Let's just pray for them. Father in the name of Jesus, let them pray that they are prayer. Thank you, Jesus, for my mommy. Thank you, Jesus, for my daddy. Thank you, Jesus. At least they've learned gratitude. That's prayer. Then they come and say, oh, I need this. Oh, let's pray about it. You need what? You need mommy to buy something for you. So what do you do? Let's pray for God to give that. My children know faith now. Right? David will tell you that. I believe that daddy will do. And it's always for a favor. I believe that daddy will have money and he will buy me this thing. And when that thing comes, she comes to tell me, I prayed for it. I said, that's my girl. You prayed for it. That's what you start to, you start to teach them from when they are young. It's not when they are old. You now say, family devotion. Which devotion now? No, they stop person now. But if it is from young, it's a habit. It's already a habit. Every Friday in my house is communion. If we don't do it, my children will not let me have peace. Even though right now for David, it's just the right being a man. <laughs> you say, can I have two blood? <laughs> I say, guy, they are not a drink blood like that. <laughs> if you drink like that, it will remain for other people. Small, small. Do you understand? But at least it's a start. In fact, it's his sisters that counsel him. That's how I say, no, it's the blood of Jesus. You can't drink it like that. <laughs> but I say, it's very sweet. Though. <laughs> but we've started that legacy. They understand that every... And the way we even do... I mean, my own, no, they, they, my own story, but they really like it when their dad... The days their dad is turn to do Bible stories with them in the night. 
So if, for instance, we, wash, we, we talk about washing of feet, me, I would gist the story here. It would be sweet. How Peter now said, no, instead of washing my feet, just bath me. The daddy would just bring, say, everybody, we're going to bring a bowl of water. We're going to wash each other's feet. But what we're going to do, we're going to write names and wrap it up. You know, that is fun. That's past okay. I will not try to be who I'm not. They will not roll paper. Roll paper, write different people's names. We'll not shake it, shake it, shake it. Everybody will pick one person's name. The person's name you picked is the person you are going to wash their feet. And you are pressing. David, I'm not washing this leg. Is that? <laughs> I stand my son. I do like him. <laughs> you know, he's to lie. He says, I'm not. But okay, now use that one to teach the principle of service. When your leg is dirty, it doesn't have the happiness to wash your feet. Ah, the boy thinks I'm. He says, I'm not washing his feet. <laughs> but you can make it practical so that they can remember. When we talked about, when we did the whole, Easter, the whole Easter season, so every night I was taking them on Thursday, I took them through Monday, Thursday, when communion was happening, how Jesus broke bread them. Then we did bread and wine. The next day we talked about when he died in, get, when he went to Gethsemane and all that, and how he died on the cross. We talked about it. How does that make you feel? The, David said, how does, how does Jesus die? In? How, am I, how am I the one that made Jesus die? You know, like, and those questions will help you think of how to treat. But what I'm trying to say is, the curiosity has already been established as children. That's what you do. You establish it from when they're children. He says, train up a child. Don't wait for it to be too late. Children, if they can learn songs, they can learn the Bible. We learn it. Don't say, ah, this King James is hard. Learn, let them learn the word. Let them learn the word. Let them learn stories, memory verses. So the Bible says they should meditate on the scriptures. So you need to take time. Take time and invest in teaching them. Okay? It's very important. Um, finally, let me close with this. Think legacy. Okay? When you're trying to evangelize your children, you need to think of legacy. Give me Genesis 6.18. You see, when God wanted to start afresh um, after the world was full of wickedness, which is kind of like what the world is right now, People were doing all kinds of disastrous things. And then he went into covenant with Noah. And he told Noah to build an ark. And Noah built the ark. He gave him the exact specifications. This is how you must do it. This is how you must do it. This is how you must do it. And then he said something to him in Genesis 6, 18. He says, I will establish my covenant with you. And you shall go into the ark. Your, you, your sons, your wife, and your son's wives. So, most times when I read this scripture... What I think about is, God could have told Noah to enter the ark alone. He said, he could have even told him to enter the ark with just his wife. He said, enter with your wife, your sons, and your sons' wives. So it is not just your responsibility to make sure that you are saved. It is also your responsibility to make sure that your children are saved and preserved. Many years ago when I first came to this church and I wanted to start children's church, one of the things God said to me, he said, the reason why the church has not gone extinct, and I've shared this many times, is because there's a preserved generation that still remembers the principles of God. So when I heard that, I said, that's the truth. The only reason why you still have Christianity is because somebody, somebody somewhere passed it down to somebody, who passed it down to somebody, who passed it down to somebody. So it is passing on legacy. So we're not just going to be Christians and just make it to heaven. We have to make sure that the legacy remains. Jesus didn't die for a religion. Jesus didn't die for a religion. If not, he could have just stayed with his 12. But he died so that this thing will spread far. It says, except a grain of wheat fall to the ground and die. It abides alone. So we need to be conscious of the fact that we are also supposed to help our children. It's not enough for them to be saved. Part of the assignment as parents is to deliver a rich legacy in Christ for them. Joseph, Joseph saved the Egyptians. You know that, right? By his wisdom, interpreting the dream and helping them to come up with a plan. That's the year of plenty, let's save so that when there's no plenty, we'll be able to survive. But the Bible says something very interesting. It said there was a Pharaoh that arose that did not know Joseph. So what happened? The children of Israel now went into slavery. He, be, he made them slaves because somebody somewhere did not pass the baton correctly. Someone did not tell him that, ah, these people, they are the ones that saved us, so, so we don't touch them. Somebody did not do their job. You as a parent, 
do not drop the baton. God is counting on you to preserve this generation so they can preserve the next. It's your responsibility to raise a preserved generation that still knows God. And if we're not careful, we'll miss that. Let me end. How will you do that? How do you ensure that a generation that does not know God ever comes into existence? How do you ensure it doesn't happen? Deuteronomy 6. I'll read that and we'll close. Deuteronomy 6 verse 1. It says, these are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess. Verse 2. He says, so that you, your children, and their children after them may do what? May fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commandments that I give you so that you may enjoy a long life. Next verse. And he says, hear Israel and be careful to obey. Um, give, me, give me verse 5. And then he tells them what to do. Love the Lord your God. These are things you will teach them. So he says, love your Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Verse 6. He says, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Seven. Impress them on your children. So it's not enough for you to know it. You need to impress them on your children. He says, talk about them when you sit at home. When you walk around the, along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. So everything you are doing, you say, take it as an opportunity to teach your children about God. To impress it on them. How do you impress something on someone? You leave a mark so that the person sees it and... When they impress slap on you, do you not remember not to do? <laughs> so when you impress something, uh, Pastor Paul says, imitate me as I imitate Christ. As the children are watching your lifestyle, they are seeing, it's being impressed on their mind that, oh, this is how we behave. This is how we react. When they say we should honor people, we honor them. We give. We so Not when you get home, you sit down and discuss every time, church, every time, money, money, money. I don't care what you tell your children. They watch you. If you go home and you have, you discuss you sit down, you discuss people. And then you tell your children, don't you know gossiping is bad? Wow. Really, daddy? Really? So he says, when you are at home, oh, when you are eating, when you are lying down, when you are walking with them on the road, every opportunity, put Christ in it. And that's why I started with Romans 12. That it says everything, you're waking up life, you're going to bed life, you're eating, you're going to work. Every single part of your life, should evangelize for your children. It should be preaching the gospel. They should see you and want to be like you. Please, do not make your children hate church. I want to say this especially to parents of teenagers. When your children do wrong, do not use church as a punishment tool. Because that happens a lot. Because you think that's what they enjoy. That I'm going to stop you from that church you are going to. How can church be what you use to punish your children? How? It's as if it's that church you are going to that. How? The work you are not doing, the church is doing it, and you want to keep them from going there. Because you say you want to inflict pain, pain on them. I don't want, I don't, it's, it's as if it's misbehave. That's the only thing, that's the only thing that you take from them that pains them. Are you, are you, are you, are you okay? Are you okay? How, 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 how is your thought process, how we, How? Never use church as a punishment tool. Never. Never use their love of God to blackmail them. Never. That's what he says, Father, don't frustrate your children. So every opportunity you get to minister to your children by your life, by your words, by counsel, by training them, by discipline, make sure you use it. That's the only way we can be sure that we will always have a preserved generation. Were you blessed this morning? Hey people, so if I have never invited you to be a part of Praying Pastor M, let me apologize officially and let me take this opportunity to invite you to be a part of a very growing family on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, please follow me at Pastor Mildred and join me 3 p.m. every day, West African time to be a part of what we do. Um, it's just a time where we get to learn about the Word of God, have fun, talk about real life issues, and just connect with each other. So please be a part of it every day of the week, Monday to Saturday, 3 p.m. with p.m. Praying with Pastor M. God bless you.